part one of a series of analytical videos where I will go through the whole of Wuthering Heights. Been ambitious, you see the length of the novel, but I'm going to go through the whole thing and I'm going to say what's happening, go over a few things, pick out bits I think are interesting. It's a text I've worked with for a very long time now, so I like to think I've got a few ideas, but I'm sure along the way you'll have your own ideas and you'll pick up your own ideas and have your own thoughts as you're looking at it as well. So without further ado, we'll begin. And it is obviously, it's a, a challenging novel, but it is considered one of the greats of English literature. And I'm using here this reproduction of uh, an early edition of it. Um, so as you can see, there, it doesn't say Emily Bronte, it says Ellis Bell. And that's a little contextual fact where obviously she is a female writer writing in a time when you didn't get many female writers. So she's using a male pseudonym there and her sisters did as well, actually. But the yeah, Ellis Bell, but notice, ha ha ha, the initials are there. If I get the pointer ready as well, which one should we use? We'll use the hand on this one. OK, so there you go. Yeah, that's working. There you go. EB. So I've highlighted some parts of chapter one just to discuss and just to pick out. First thing I wanted to mention is about the setting of the novel. So 1801, the time setting, it's set in the past of when the novel was actually written. So the novel was originally published in 1847. So it covers a, a wide time period as well. But remember, it's set in the past of when it was actually written. And you've got some elements here. Now, the context is you've got the narrator here. The first narrator is this guy, Mr. Lockwood, who is visiting his new landlord, Heathcliff. Mr. Heathcliff is actually his only his name, Heathcliff, who is the owner of the house he's staying in, which is Thrushcross Grange. So there's two big houses in this part of the world. It's near the fictional village of Gimmerton, and you've got Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. So Lockwood is our out-of-frame narrator, so this is something that to get your head round as well, is that there's lots of narrators in Wuthering Heights, but the one on the outside is Lockwood, who is telling stuff. Sometimes other characters are actually telling us as well. So remember that. And he's quite an interesting character in his own way, but when people start the novel, sometimes they find his voice, as created by Emily Bronte, quite difficult to penetrate and to really uh, see what he's actually saying but I think there's some good reasons for that and I'll bring in some of that into the discussion as we go through even in this first chapter actually. So I'm going to start with this point though so this is certainly a beautiful country and the novel is very much influenced by the romantic movement and part of the romantic movement it's not necessarily to do with love specifically but of course it's to do with emotions and the appreciations of emotions but also an emotional response to nature and also an appreciation of nature as well so there's a lot of nature is like another character the moors themselves is like another character in the novel and that is part of it. it's a beautiful country so the romantics as in the romantic poets the romantic movement they were interested in our emotional response to nature, like that absolutely joyous feeling you can get like when you're out in nature or other emotions. You could even have fear, I suppose, as well. But so he's gone here. He's going to this part of the world because he actually said, I haven't highlighted this bit, so far removed from the stir of society. Or not, I didn't say far, I just made that word up. I could not have fixed on a situation so completely removed from the stir of society. So he's getting away from it all, basically. Lockwood wants to get away from some something that's happened. He wants a bit of a quiet time, so he's renting a house. He must be very rich because Thrushcross Grange is massive. It's a big, posh house. So he's obviously from a wealthy background as well. And he's not from round these parts. So the setting of the novel, obviously, it's in um, Yorkshire. It's in the Yorkshire Moors. Lockwood isn't from there. I'm guessing he's probably a southerner of some kind. I think he's from the south, but I couldn't say for certain. It doesn't say in the novel, so we don't know. I just have a bit of a feeling. That's how I imagine him anyway. Then we have this idea of a perfect misanthropist heaven. So a misanthropist is someone who hates the world. And he thinks of himself as being, you know, I'm I'm a grumpy, I'm a grumpy git, so I feel like that. He's not actually really a grumpy git, but he thinks he is. 
don't use grumpy git in essays. But he thinks he's grumpy and miserable. And Mr. Heathcliff and I are such a suitable pair to divide the desolation between us. So he thinks, oh, I've met... Because he's writing this, obviously, his recollection of the past. So I've just returned from my visit to my landlord. So this is what happened. So the things we're about to read in this first chapter have actually already happened in Lockwood's mind, as Emily Bronte is writing it like this. And he thinks, oh, well, he's he's really grumpy as well. And he's kind of miserable about things. So this is going to be great. We can indulge in our emotions we can indulge in our misery and we can be great friends you know sharing in our grumpiness basically so his verdict is of a capital fellow so he thinks he's great basically so that's a little exclam exclamatory sentence there so when he meets him and he doesn't quite get the warm greeting he's expecting so his black eyes would draw so suspiciously under their brows i rode up and when his fingers sheltered themselves with a jealous resolution still further in his waistcoat as i announced my name so his body language is suggesting he's not friendly at all is he there and as a metaphor there his fingers sheltered themselves as well that bit of personification actually you could say as well so he's talking to mr heathcliff mr lockwood your new tenant sir I've done this bit as a kind of bigger highlight in it because otherwise it would have just been a big wodge of green. But I was going to talk about this about, I think I've effectively said it anyway, that he's renting out Flush Cross Grange and he's going to meet his landlord. Heathcliff responds with, Thrush Cross Grange is my own, sir, he interrupted, wincing. I should not allow anyone to inconvenience me if I could hinder it, walk in. So you get the, this is Heathcliff's character as being established very early by Bronte as being unfriendly, unwelcoming, Thrush Cross Grange, my own sir, wincing, you know, it suggests a kind of negative response there as well. Should not allow anyone to inconvenience me if I could hinder it. Basically, I'll, I'll, mess, up, I'll mess you up if I thought you were going to uh, inconvenience me in any way. Basically, he would, he would be quite easy, it would be quite easy for him to stop someone from inconveniencing him. So he isn't presented by Bronte as a friendly character straight away, which makes this even more interesting. Like Lockwood's own kind of judgment of Heathcliff seems to be wrong, doesn't it, already? This is a bit of a religious reference here because that is a euphemism. Go to the juice. It means go to the devil. So he says, the walk-in was uttered with closed teeth and expressed the sentiment, go to the juice, which means to go to the devil. So as if he's saying, as if he's saying in a much more angry way, He's saying it kind of almost grudgingly or in an angry style. So it's an unwelcoming place, Wuthering Heights. Then I felt interested in a man who seemed more exaggeratedly reserved than myself. So look, he's not a great judge of character and particularly his own character as well. Like he's not really reserved himself in the same way as Heathcliff. But again, I will get to that. I've got something else I'm going to say about that. So well, this page hasn't copied itself so well, but you get the idea down the side here. Lockwood's snobbery, uh, Emily Bronte established him as being quite snobbish because he has, here we have the whole establishment of domestics, I suppose, the eyes being chopped off there, was a reflection suggested for this compound order. Emily Bronte gives Lockwood a very pompous, overcomplicated style, very verbose is a good word, V-R-B-O-S-E, very verbose, as in, he uses more words than he should really, so, but you can see how pompous he is. You can think, oh, that's weird. He's asking this servant to take Mr Lockwood's horse and bring up some wine. But, well, normally that would be more, that would be multiple servants. So that's a bit weird. Again, it's a context point because in this era, you've got, obviously, rich people have got lots of servants in England at the time. And more snobbishness here. No wonder the grass grows up between the flags and cattle are the only hedge cutters. When he says flags, he doesn't mean the flapping flags. He means flagstones. So he means the what we'd think of like paving, basically. So there's grass growing there. The cattle are the only hedge cutters there. The, the cattle are just eating the hedges. and So you're getting a sense of Wuthering Heights as a building of being remote, wild. Emily Bronte's got it kind of matching the personality of Heathcliff there as well. We've also got Lockwood's snobbishness has been established too. Then we have a description of Joseph, who is a miserable old codger, who's always, he's quite religious, but he's not particularly nice. And sometimes when people read the novel, they're, they're put off by Joseph because he's so incomprehensible. But I think Emily Bronte makes him deliberately incomprehensible, because if it's framed from Lockwood's perspective, 
he's not from the area. He won't understand the local accent when it's really strong. And it heightens that sense of alienation. So we have more kind of comments from Lockwood. This is this time about Joseph. Looking meantime in my face so sourly that I charitably conjectured he must have needed divine aid to digest his dinner and his pious ejaculation and no reference to my unexpected advent. So the Lord help us. He's assuming that Joseph is, is maybe burping or he's got a bad tummy or it could be even it could be even farting for all we know. I don't know. But the idea, look at his face. So there's a bit of kind of there's a bit of humour and sarcasm built in. You have to look quite closely for it. And the pious ejaculation, I should say as well, in those days, that word just meant to say something out loud suddenly, just to clear that one up, so to speak. Anyway. The um, next bit, moving on swiftly. So Wuthering Heights is the name of Mr Heathcliff's dwelling, so really important. Wuthering, again, notice the Lockwood pompous style that Bronte gives in a significant provincial adjective descriptive of the atmospheric tumult which his station is exposed in stormy weather. What he means is this is like a local dialect word. So you can see there's a bit of a value judgment from Lockwood about saying that's not really standard English in that way that he's used to. It's a wuthering is a word that's used in the local dialect and it suggests that it's battered by the wind and the weather, the stormy weather. Pure bracing ventilation they must have up here at all times. So again, there's lots of value culturally in the 19th century. Good air was considered to be very important for good health as well. So that's an important thing there. That's why that's so emphasised. One may guess the power of the north wind blowing over the edge by the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house. And by a range of gaunt thorns all stretching their limbs one way as if craving arms of the sun. Interesting this bit as well because really you could say this not only kind of foreshadows what we're going to learn about Heathcliff but it kind of symbolises Heathcliff because... As a child, the events that he experiences shape his personality and that what makes him how he is when Lockwood meets him. So he's kind of bent and shaped by the events that he's grown up in and that's what's made him the man he is. At this stage, he just seems quite grumpy. We don't know all the details about Heathcliff, but we are going to find out. This is, this is Bronte. She's meant to be intriguing you to think, OK, I want to find out about Heathcliff. So we have a medieval feel to Wuthering Heights itself. Narrow windows deeply set in the wall and the corners defended with large jutting stones. So Emily Bronte makes deliberate lexical choices that suggest almost like a fortification. So Wuthering Heights is not a very welcoming building. It's not a very modern building. It's got these architectural features that suggest it's like a castle as well. Then we have just to even hammer this home even further grotesque carving lavished over the front well grotesques are what people normally mislabel as gargoyles gargoyles have to have water flowing through them normally it's through the mouths of like a rock little, little rock creature you know carved out of stone kind of built into a wall of an old cathedral or something like that but grotesques are the little ones that are normally like sitting there with little bat wings and like dog legs and those kind of things so that's what I mean. So what we normally think of, what a lot of people think of as gargoyles, but what are actually technically called grotesques. So it means that. So it's got those kind of carved monsters on it over the front and then above the door as well. The age of the building, 1500. So again, that emphasises the medieval aspect of the building. Obviously, this isn't set in medieval times, but the fictional house has been there a long time. And the name Hareton Earnshaw as well. This isn't the same Hareton Earnshaw... If you know the novel and you've read it on, and there is a head to know, I'm sure, in the novel, but there's lots of characters in this novel were named after other characters or other, you know, other characters we don't even meet in the novel, and this is one of them. Hareton Earnshaw. There was another Hareton Earnshaw in 1500 who actually built Wuthering Heights. So the, the family name of Earnshaw is very old in the area, you know, hundreds of years old. So he does say about wanting to find out about the history of the place, but he doesn't. Then he goes into the sitting room. We've seen that. He goes into Wuthering Heights itself. We get a description of the interior. So we get a sense of the decorations or the, the decor. Immense pewter dishes interspersed with silver jugs and tankards. So again, that feels very medieval, doesn't it? Very old world. 
towering row after row and a vast oak dresser to the very roof. So lo loads of these things there. And it has that to me suggests a very medieval kind of feel. Again, as Bronte is constructing this setting. Then we've got the actual food. So it's quite simple fare, oat cakes, clusters of legs of beef, mutton and ham. So we're getting a sense of, again, a medieval feel to it, even though it's obviously not set in that era. And again, there's a sense of violence. More decorations are sundry, villainous old guns. Villainous old guns. That's transferred epithet because guns can't actually be villainous on their own. Spelling's unusual as well. And a couple of horse pistols. So there's a sense of violence there as well. Ruggedness. It's remote. There's a medieval feel to it. There's a sense of violence coming through it as well. Three gaudily painted canisters disposed along its edge. Again, more snobbery, gaudily painted, so he thinks they're not particularly nice looking. Then the chairs, like the chairs, high-backed primitive structures, painted green. So these aren't like fashionable furniture items of the era. These are, again, very... He actually, Bronte even uses the word primitive, primitive structures, so they're very kind of basic, rugged. They suit the heights. They suit the atmosphere of the place. Then also you've got dogs all over the place as well. There's an, an arch on the dresser reposing a huge liver-coloured bitch pointer surrounded by a swarm of squealing puppies and other dogs haunted other recesses. Again, Lockwood, Bronte is given Lockwood this choice of verb haunted. Again, so a suggestion of the supernatural and the idea of, of lots of dogs lurking in shadows and there's a sense of threat about the place as well, particularly for Lockwood as an outsider, as a visitor. So I'm going to skip on a bit to go on to this significant description of Heathcliff. As he says, he is a dark-skinned gypsy in aspect. So this is going to show again like 19th century attitudes to um, ethnicity as well. Heathcliff's ethnicity actually in the novel is another little side alley you can go down. It's quite interesting to explore because people in that era would be very ignorant about ethnicity but I will come to that again in a future chapter that's more of a discussion for them but right now that's Lockwood's impression of him so dark-skinned gypsy in aspect his dressing man is a gentleman so for the era you see there's definitely like a paradox there in Lockwood's mind as a character that hey, there's, some, there's some strange things here about this situation again Bronte trying to intrigue the reader as well so Heathcliff is not conventional He's not a conventional landlord. He's living in this rougher house than he could be because Thrushwell Grange is a better house. And in that era when you're obsessed with status and property and that's associated to you, you've got a social standing as well. Why is Heathcliff not living in the better house? And why does he appear physically to differ you know, from, from most of the population around? He looks different. So emphasising a sense of difference here, Bronte. Um, yeah, that is as much a gentleman as many a country squire. So again, some snobbery. Again, suggests to me that Lockwood is a city man, effectively, and a bit judgmental about the countryside. So he's a bit snobbish, you know, still a gentleman, but, you know, he's a bit rough and scruffy, basically. But strangely, again, he's an erect and handsome figure, so he stands up straight and bears himself well. So Bronte's establishing Heathcliff is a, is a contradictory figure already, very early on in the novel. So I'm going to skip the next page. There's other things you can pick out, of course. But we get a bit of Lockwood's backstory, which is quite interesting because he's this is the this is the whole reason that he's come up to stay at Thrushcross Grange, to get away from this terrible trauma. But see what you think of this terrible, tr terrible trauma here. Well, enjoying a month of fine weather at the seacoast, I was thrown into the company of a most fascinating creature, a real goddess in my eyes, as long as she took no notice of me. Well, that's a bit weird. Basically, he's fancied someone. So there's someone he's attracted to, a real goddess in my eyes, as long as she took no notice of me. So he seems like he's very shy, obviously very inexperienced with women as well. And again, it's an era, particularly for upper classes, for wealthier classes, there's a lot of social rules and codes in this era about how you should court, would be the name of it, or how people basically would get together. And you've got to also get the approval of the parents as well. I never told my love vocally. Still, if looks have language, the merest idiot might have guessed I was over head and ears. So, again, look at Lockwood's attitude here. 
he's blaming the woman for not realising... <laughs> I mean, look at this, it doesn't make any sense, does it? He's blaming her for not realising that he was in love with her. But anyway, I actually I was going to say something else, but I'm going to save that. So she understood me at last and looked to return the sweetest of all imaginable looks. And what did I do? I confess it with shame, shrunk icily into myself like a snail, simile. And every glance retired colder and farther till finally the poor innocent was led to doubt her own senses and overwhelmed with confusion at her supposed mistake, persuaded her mamma to decamp. So he was being so pathetic here, basically, like he couldn't, he was assuming, oh, she should have worked out that I was in love with her. And when she actually returned a look that showed interest, he just basically went into his shell, as we have here. So she then thought, oh, he actually can't be interested in me at all. So goes off with her mother. By this curious turn of disposition, I've gained the reputation of deliberate heartlessness. How undeserved I alone can appreciate. So this is actually a very hyperbolic description of a very minor very minor incident, a kind of a lack of maturity on Lockwood's part, because he's probably younger as a character than we generally imagine him, to be fair. So he's probably in his 20s, I would assume, but I don't know for certain. But, and he's, it's just this fail in his mind, this is great love affair. And this is why he's so sad and why he wants to go and spend some time in the countryside. But what Bronte's doing is, is that she's got our narrator character as someone who is completely kind of inexperienced he has no real understanding of true love the love that's in Wuthering Heights is a bit of a strange kind of depiction of it but again that's something that we will get to later we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves but yeah that's what we set up here our narrator is really inexperienced and he's a bit pathetic so you're not really necessarily meant to like Lockwood in case you thought you were meant to like him there's this great bit as well when he's harassed by the dogs. He, he tries to stroke one of the dogs and he said, it leapt on my knees. She broke into a fury and leapt on my knees. I flung her back and hastened to interpose the table between us. This this proceeding roused the whole hive. Half a dozen four-footed fiends of various sizes and ages issued from hidden dens to the common centre. I felt my heels and coat laps, peculiar subjects of assault, and parrying off the larger competence as effective as I could with a poker, I was con- I've lost my word. I was constrained under attack, but notice at the bottom it says, my heels and coat laps, peculiar subjects of assault. The dogs are just sort of fussing around him by the sound of it. But behind, demand allowed assistance from some of the household in re-establishing peace. So basically, he tries to stroke a dog. The dog jumps up on him. He makes out he's being attacked. The dog's probably, read between the lines there, the dog's probably being friendly. And then all the other dogs come at him as well. He is an unreliable narrator. He is presenting this as an attack. But actually, if you think about it, it's quite a comic scene because you've got this posh, refined, just, uh, probably southern gentleman in this rough Wuthering Heights. And he's there and he's got this, oh my goodness, oh, get off me, you beastly things. And they're not really doing much. We find out they've not bitten him or anything, so they can't really be attacking him. If they wanted to, they could. So we have an interest of where one of the, uh, I think this is Zilla actually, um, she's working in the kitchen and she rushes out to deal with the dog. So a lusty dame with tucked up gown, bare arms and fire flushed cheeks rushed into the midst of us flourishing a frying pan and used that weapon, a metaphor, and her tongue to such purpose that the storm subsided magically and she only remained having like a sea after a high wind when her master entered on the scene. So you've got the use of um, Zugma here actually, I love that term, so she used that weapon and her tongue to such purpose that the storm subsided magically. And I suppose it took, so technically that's a metonym because she's not licking the dogs. But Zugma, Z-E-U-G-M-A, great term. And it means you're getting two meanings off of, in this case, it's the same verb. So it's the idea. What you're getting is Bronte's using this idea of she's hitting the dogs with a frying pan and she's shouting at them. But Bronte doesn't just say that. She says, use that weapon and her tongue to such purpose that the storm subsided magically so that's the idea is that she's yeah so it's zugma so it's interesting that one then we have faith comes in there's a biblical reference the herd of possessed swine could have no worse spirits in them than those animals of yours sir you might as well leave a stranger with a brood of tigers so hyperbole from lockwood as used by bronte there establishing his character 
Heathcliff seems to calm down a little bit after this, so guests are exceedingly rare in this house that I and my dogs I am willing to own hardly know how to receive them, your health says. So they have a drink together. There's more snobbishness from Lockwood, chipping off his pronouns and auxiliary verbs. So Lockwood's quite precise about the language that he uses. In the time this is written, English was settling down as a language in terms of ideas about fixed spellings, ideas about what standard English would be. They weren't quite completely fully there, if you see what I mean. But it's in those kind of early days of it, basically, of thinking there's a sort of standard English and some forms of English are superior to others. And so he would think... And that's one of the reasons I think why he thinks... Well, I think he's a Southern character because he's got that judgment of Northerners coming in there as well. I find that interesting. And then we have... It is astonishing how sociable I feel myself compared with him. So Bronte again making clear that Lockwood thinking of himself as this misanthropist himself. He's had this love affair in his mind that's his great epic love affair that's absolutely pathetic. It actually is nothing. And Heathcliff, the reason we will find out why Heathcliff is the way that Heathcliff is. So I'm going to stop there. Please like comment, subscribe, notification bell, all those kind of things. I'd greatly appreciate that. I, it will encourage me to make these and make more of these if you enjoyed it. And read on ahead, read on ahead, because this isn't meant to be a substitute for reading the novel. It's meant to be almost like a kind of, like a DVD commentary. It's like one of those commentaries you'd have on a DVD, like with someone's talking, you know, I'm not Emily Bronte and I didn't write it, but then, you know, you can tell, you can guess. Anyway, thank you for listening. I will make more. I will make, I will be back, like Lockwood, in the next chapter. Goodbye.